in this series we started uh, two weeks ago, uh, Focus, Seeing Jesus More Clearly. And what we're trying to do is uh, we all come with preconceived ideas and notions about who Jesus is and what he's like and, and uh, maybe some perspective. And we just want to kind of clear that away and look at how did the people who lived with him saw him. Uh, we're looking at the Gospel of John. John says he wrote these things so that we would understand who Jesus was and the implications in our lives. And, and so whenever we're doing message series and we plan them out in the future, uh, I start kind of locking in. I start reading stuff that heads toward that. I, I start uh, trying to pay attention for illustrations, things like that. And uh, this week we're talking about the first sign that was a shift for how the people saw Jesus. And so I got thinking about signs. I was on an elevator in Phoenix two weeks ago, and this sign was in the elevator. In case of fire, don't use the elevator. Use water. Some things seem obvious to me, but what do I know? And then I got in a, a, another elevator in the same bank, and they had another sign that had the same kind of stupid message on it. I realized sarcasm was what they were after, and that's my only spiritual gift, and somehow I had missed that. So... I, you know, some signs are clear and some signs aren't so clear. We're going to look at a sign, uh, the very first sign that John records us about, G, uh, about Jesus and a shift in how people saw him. It's found in John chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn there, get on your phone. There's a couple of spots that I think are good for us to highlight uh, in our scripture. John is one of those. John 2, here's how it starts. On the third day, there was a marriage of Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the marriage with his disciples. So third day, marriage in Cana, Jesus' mom is there. She actually probably had some responsibility, as we read on in this story, uh, for the reception. More than likely, because of that, she was probably a family member. Cana was just six miles from Nazareth, uh, where Jesus' hometown was. And so likely this was a family member, which is why Jesus and his ragtag group of followers that had been together a week now were invited to this wedding. And weddings for the Jewish culture were a big event. They're a big event today, but they were a massive event. Here's what would happen. On the day of the wedding, the bridegroom would uh, gather his groomsmen and they would go to the bride's, bride's family's home and, and they would put her uh, up on, on like a like a carriage of sorts and they would parade her through the town and people would line the streets and then they would all make their way down and the uh, marriage would happen and then there would be a, a reception but the reception was a massive feat everybody in the village would be invited to be a part of this and sometimes they went on for three days maybe as long as seven days it was a big deal and, and today if you get married in Israel the most expensive day to get married, the most expensive venues you can uh, uh, rent are on Tuesdays because they consider Tuesday to be a double blessed day. It comes back from Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 on the third day of creation. It's the only day of creation where God says twice and it was good. And so they count it as a double blessed day. So here they are, third day in Cana, getting married, more than likely following in that tradition. My friend Kobe in Jerusalem who told me about that tradition said, we got married on a Tuesday and then we ended up getting divorced on a Thursday. So it didn't quite work out for him. But, but here they were, gathered for this marriage ceremony. Here's what happens. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. So Mary comes with some responsibility. There would have been embarrassment for the family if they'd run out of wine. Here they are in the middle of the celebration and the wine is gone. She goes to Jesus, her son, and says, we don't have any more wine. And, um, and Jesus responds to her. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you, that, that verse is still up there. I just want you to read that silently to yourself again. Just read that verse. When you get to Jesus' response, how did you hear that? Woman, he replied, why do you involve me? Because how you hear Jesus' voice in that response influences, impacts the way you see the rest of this story, the rest of this account. Do you know all of us, about 95% of us actually, have a voice in our head when we read. When we're reading a novel, a book, a, when we read the Bible, we assign voice to various people. And so we read it with an assumption about how that person may have sound. Now, if you've learned to speed read, you've learned to ignore that voice and read without it, it, it can help you read faster. 
But almost all of us listen to a voice. So how did you hear Jesus here? Did you hear him as boring? Woman. Or reverential, you know, we always want to assign to Jesus like this, like halo over his head, and he was always like, you know, kind of, kind of very serious. So, so, so picture a God voice right here. Woman, you know, some deep thunder kind of thing. Was it, was it serious? Was he irritated? Woman. Was he aloof? Woman. How, how did you hear him? Because how you hear it is how you see this story. Now, a woman, when someone, when a male would address another female in the marketplace, in a crowd, maybe at the synagogue, and they used the word woman, when they said woman, it was a formal greeting for someone you weren't that familiar with. It really was a bit of respect, but it was a formal greeting. This is his mom, right? He knows his mom. He adores his mom. Think about the time Jesus is hanging on the cross in agony and he looks down to John and he says, John, your mother. And he says to his mom, mom, your son, someone to take care of you. So how is it that Jesus is speaking to her? And notice she doesn't get irritated. Look at what she says right after his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. She wasn't bugged by this. She didn't get irritated by what he said. What if you heard Jesus say this with a smile on his lips, with a bit of a chuckle in his voice? Like, come on, Mom. Why are you dragging me in already? Because, you know, his mother actually knew where things were headed. His mother knew what was coming. Jesus had just called his first disciples. Now his ministry was beginning. And you know how moms are. Moms are proud. I mean, like, they try to be anyways, right? Your mom wants to be proud of you. You know, people who have on their cars the bumper sticker, my kid's an honor student at whatever school. Or if you're a redneck, my kid beats up honor students, at, you know, whatever that. Jesus' mom had on the back of, of her donkey. My son is God. Kind of trumped everybody, basically, at this point. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And here's what happens. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing. Hang on to that spot right there. We're going to come back to there. Each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now throw out, uh, draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from. And though the servants had drawn the water, they knew... Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you saved the best till now. So we get all these details from John. There are six uh, jars of water, ceremonial washing jars. They fill them to the brim. There's about 180 gallons of water. Jesus turns the water into wine. The servants see the miracle that happens. They go get the guy in charge of the banquet, the guy that's kind of hosting, the one putting on all the food. And he tastes it and goes, whoa, what happened? He goes to the bridegroom who would have been embarrassed by running out and said, what are you doing here? Everybody else I know serves the best stuff first when people are thinking clearly. And then when the party's going on for a few days, they bring out the box wine, the stuff you cut with water. What are you doing serving the very best? 180 gallons of water, 682 liters. There's a one and a third liter in a bottle of wine. This is 908 bottles of wine of the best stuff that Jesus shows up here with. And people are overwhelmed. This is amazing. And, and, and how do you see Jesus standing here? Was he there doing the like, oh, man, this is not what I want to do yet. My mom needs some help. And so he does the little, you know, thing. And, what, and then he stands there with his arms folded watching people. Is he standing there like we see him in the pictures that have come over the centuries of, you know, kind of, kind of pale looking, you know, bored, curmudgeon kind of? I actually see Jesus like laying, laying his head back laughing at this point. He got 908 bottles of the best wine that's ever been uh, produced. And I think he's poking Nathaniel in the ribs. And why do I think that? Go back into chapter 1, the end of that chapter. Here's how it starts. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you standing under a fig tree? 
Hang on, you're going to see greater things than that. And so here they are now a week later, and there they just turned this water into wine. They got this massive amount of wine. It's the best wine ever. I think Jesus poking an Italian rib. Hey, dude, look at that. And it's just getting started now. <laughs> I, think, I think Jesus is, is, is throwing out joy here. This is extravagant here. But there's something bigger going on than just Jesus doing some supernatural thing of turning the water into wine. Because now there's a turn, there's a shift. John calls it, and this was the first sign. Here's what he said. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Don't miss that turn. Don't miss this shift. A sign on a road is a marker for us. And here's this marker. That this was the time when now they had shifted. John's saying this was the first time when we turned. This was the first time when we realized this wasn't just some rabbi who was a good teacher, good with people. And had invited us who had already been passed over, if you remember from last week, by every other rabbi on the planet. This, this man is different. And it was from here that they recognized that there was something different about Jesus. And as we go on and watch these signs unfold through the Gospel of John, it drives deeper and deeper home the point that this is the Lord of the universe. This is God who showed up himself. This is God incarnate, fully human and fully God. And John says this, and we believed. There was a shift in their thinking. There was a shift in how they said the ground had moved underneath them and they moved with it. And that's the very shift that John is inviting us to make. He wants us to see Jesus not simply as a good man, as this historical figure, as this uh, great uh, miracle worker. He wants us to see him as the son of God and to pray, place our hearts and our trust, our lives in his hands. Jesus had gone, come, God had saved the very best for the last. Actually, the bridegroom had showed up. And this, this turning the water into wine was a bigger deal than maybe what we read in. Paul, the Apostle Paul, says this sign is like this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. The old is gone, the new is here. What had been done is being shifted. Something new has arrived. What, what, what we were following, now we're going to change gears. What traditions we had become accustomed to, now God was doing something new. And what was that new thing? Well, look, the, Jesus changing these ceremonial jars, the passage tells us, they were used for... Uh, the traditional cleansing, the purification the Jews would go through. And God had given a command about coming uh, to him before him in a pure way, in a holy way. And, and over the centuries, they had taken those commands of God and they'd twisted and turned them. And they'd added addendum after addendum after addendum on them. And now you got whole handbooks and pages to follow. And, and now it had become this very perfunctory thing that was meaningless to them, except... When a wedding would happen like this, the whole village would get invited. That meant the rabbis would be invited. The Pharisees would be invited. And, and the Pharisees would kind of serve as the soup Nazis here. And they would make sure that everyone followed all the rules. So no surprise that someone had 180 gallons of, of water for ceremonial cleansing. Because every time they would have shared in a meal, which over several days would have been a bunch of times, everyone was required to go through the ceremonial hand washing before they could eat. And the Pharisees would stand there to watch that that had happened. And Jesus takes that old order of Jewish tradition and turns it on its head. Flips it over. Transforming the water into wine was Jesus just getting started and what he was going to do in transforming our relationship to God the Father. It wasn't going to be about religion. It wasn't going to be about ritual. It wasn't going to be about tradition. It was going to be about the change he wanted to bring to our hearts and our souls before God the Father. And this ceremonial cleansing... In fact, we see a scene later in Jesus' life, Mark records it for us, that gives us some idea of the background here. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law 
who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. And they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and the Jews don't eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law went to Jesus and asked, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and you're holding on to human traditions. And so when Jesus takes these ceremonial jars of purification water and turns them into wine, he is saying these old commands, this thing that you think somehow put you right before God, this thing that you think, I have come to turn all of that on end. I want to bring the party back. I want to bring the life back. I want to bring the relationship back. I want to bring the joy back. Because in Jewish culture, wine was symbolic to joy. The rabbis would say, without wine, there is no joy. The bridegroom would have been embarrassed if the wine would have run out in the party. And Jesus turning this water into wine is more than just accommodating some guests at some feast to make his mom feel good. It was saying, I am taking that which is old and I'm going to flip it on to something that's new. I'm taking that which you have turned into a tradition that is meaningless to you and I want to turn you into a relationship with the Father. I want to bring the party back to your life. I want to bring the love and the hope and the promise and the grace back to your life. And so when Jesus turns this water into wine, he is taking an old tradition... Do you hear what he said to these Pharisees later on? You worship God with your lips. Your hearts are far from you. You follow all the rules. But they're just human rules. They actually keep you from God. The ceremonial jars for symbolic washings were stuffy and somber. They were trappings of a system gone bad. A ritual that had become empty and void of any kind of meaning or purpose. And they'd taken the life out of the relationship. They'd lost the joy. We were at Disneyland with four of our grandkids, our, our kids here in town. And, and uh, you know, if you've been to Disney, you know what that's like. It's a good experience. It's a lot of fun. But our four-year-old Sadie, she, she's like at the perfect age to go to Disney. I mean, everything was magical to her. Every, everything about it. Every character that came along, she was right there hugging them like they were her best friend, taking pictures. And, and it was awesome. Cooper, on the other hand, too, he loved talking about those characters till they actually showed up near him. And then, then it was like, whoa. I don't, and he'd cover his eyes like, they can't see me, uh, so I can't see them. Right? They're, they're, they're like, they don't know I'm here. It was that kind of thing. But Sadie was fun. We were coming out of one ride and Sadie looked up and said can we just stay here I love this place <laughs> but you know at the end of the day they kick you out nobody gets to live in Disney truth is there's a lot of things in our lives that take the joy out aren't there and if we're not careful some of the stuff we do in our faith can be like that some of us have gotten the rules down or right, we follow the rituals we show up at church we we pray before a meal, we read our Bible, and if we're not careful, they get perfunctory to us, meaningless. In just a little bit, we're going to share in communion, and if we're not careful, sometimes communion is, well, here it comes down the row, uh, give me the cracker and the juice, and I'm going to move on. And, and Jesus is saying to us, don't let the trappings of religion, don't let the trappings of ritual, don't let those things that get twisted and turned on you keep you from actually finding the joy that comes in a relationship with me. As I've come to fix the hole in your car, I've come to give rest to your soul, I've come uh, to bring life to the party, I, I, I want you to see that God is a gracious God, a hopeful God, a promising God, a loving God, a God of fun and joy. So where's the joy gone out for you? Marriage? Family? Faith, work, purpose. Maybe if we let Jesus back into those things. Maybe if we invited him 
to the party. Maybe if we let him turn on end the things we've grown accustomed to and have kind of gotten a bit bored with. Maybe if we invite Jesus in, we find the joy again. Because you remember why John wrote, John chapter 20, here's what he said. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in him. I love what John says earlier. He says when he gets done writing, if everything Jesus did were written down, uh, the world couldn't contain all the books or the libraries. And here he is telling us about this simple wedding feast. Why? Because it was a sign. It was a shift. And what was the shift? It was when the followers went, whoa, there is something happening here, and it isn't what we expected. Where was the shift? It was when Jesus had come to take what was old and flip it on its end and make it new. Where was the shift? It was when they believed that he was the Son of God and could fix their hearts and bring the joy back to their moments, restore them back to God the Father, bringing life. And that's exactly what God wants to do in our hearts. John writes this so that you and I, when we read, we might see Jesus clearly. We might see him as the Son of God. And when we give our hearts to him, we might find life. Life for all of our moments. Life for all of our days. For all of our relationship. For all the things we're doing. That God brings life and breathes life into that. And life for not just this life. For the promise and hope that comes through Christ. So I have no idea where you are on the journey right now. Some of you are asking and seeking. I hope that, that you'll drill in and, and keep asking good questions. And I hope you'll come and give your hearts to Jesus. That's what he wants you to do. To find life in him. And, and if somewhere for you faith has gotten stale, how is it you let God throw a party? And how do you let him disrupt the flow for you? How do you allow him to turn on end what's become kind of boring and, and, and accommodation to you and turn it into a relationship of joy and hope and promise? Because that's why John wants us to see Jesus. This week, Billy Graham died. Probably the most influential uh, Christian uh, uh, for a lot of years, millions and millions of people had come to know Jesus through him and, and in turn influenced others. Years and years ago, here's what he said. Someday you'll read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. Why? Because there was a shift. There was a day when Billy Graham saw Jesus as the Son of God, and there was a day when he accepted him as his Lord and Savior. And so when Billy Graham drew his last breath last week, he was just slipping from one place to home. And he had life, and he has life. And that comes through Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. And thank you, Father, that, that you show up at the parties and and that you want to see us for who you are. And you want us to be drawn to you. And Father, I just thank you for the privilege of that. And Father, help us to see you as Lord and as Savior. To see you as one who's majestic and one who comes alongside us. To see you in those moments when, when you were laughing and in those moments when your tears were drawing us to the Father. Father, help us to see Jesus. We pray in his name.